All right. Well, welcome to the episode number 16 of ASRG World, um, bringing you the latest in automotive research, innovation, and education. My name is John Heldreth, founder and your host for tonight. We have really a cool presentation for you tonight. Um, we have Enrico Pozabon with us. He's going to talk about these, these keys that you keep in your cell phones. The NFC virtual keys um, and how they kind of work and what type of security issues they might have. Uh, he's hopefully we're going to have time for a demonstration. So really cool stuff going on tonight. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself. Um, my my name is John Heldreth. Just one second here while we get things going. There we go. All right, let me introduce myself quickly. As I said, my name is John Heldreth. I'm the founder of Automotive Security Research Group, or ASRG. I've worked in the automotive industry for like eh, the last 15 years and recently focused on product security. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan in the USA, but today I'm living in Germany and working at Porsche Engineering as the product security team lead. Please feel free to contact me or follow me on LinkedIn or other social media platforms. Always happy to hear what's going on, meet new people. So. Just quickly, the Automotive Security Research Group is a nonprofit company focusing on the advancement of the automotive security industry. This is a community to support the coming together of two areas of competencies, the IT security market and the automotive market. This is a community for you, for the, the automotive engineer, for the IT security specialist, the, the beginner, the expert, the, the hobbyist, even for the people that might be in the wrong YouTube channel. This is for you. We are trying to remove the boundaries that can occur in the automotive security industry. This could be things like communication, borders, finding ways to learn the new technologies, seeing what different solutions are out there, making good decisions because at the end of the day, we all have the same goals. And this is to keep our customers who are really our, our families and our friends, keeping their data safe and secure, which can only be achieved together. We focus on three areas of development, knowledge, networking, and collaboration. For knowledge, we want to focus on increasing security-related competencies within the automotive industry. To ensure that the people working on the solutions for automotive products have the information that they need to make the best decisions, to make the best recommendations, and so on. Basically, we want to ensure everyone has the opportunity to learn and grow in the automotive security fields. By networking, if you can't find the information, then having a network of professionals is very important. They might know where to look, have a different experience, be able to give you recommendations. We can't know everything ourselves. However, as a community, we are stronger and together we can support each other. The last point is collaboration. Since ASRG is a nonprofit corporation, we have an unbiased and offer us unbiased opinion and offer a space where members and sponsors can innovate outside of the company. This innovation is organized into projects. Some of these projects uh, might include threat intelligence platforms, which is a project currently going on. Uh, we're also working on an ASRG portal where we can have all of this knowledge and networking going on. If you want to get more involved and create an impact on the industry, please send us an email at hello at ASRG.io or reaching out to us over Slack, Telegram, or even by sending us an old school written letter. All of the links are listed below in the YouTube description. Please get in contact with us.
We love to hear from new people. So first of all, ASRG has 4,462 members today. This is over 29 different locations. We have one new location this week, uh, that's Kerala, India. So we wanna welcome the, the members of Kerala and thank Anas for, for supporting and being the lead in um, Kerala, India. So um, he's also very well involved with the university there and IEEE. So welcome Anas to the ESRG family. Um, we have 29 locations, but there could be a location where it's not close to you. If you want to start an ASRG location, please let us know. Send us an email at hello at ASRG.io. We'll just talk about what makes sense and then look for opportunities to have an ASRG near you. Very good. We have so many cool talks. Since our community is driven by the members, all of these people are members. These are the people that want to give presentations. If you want to give a presentation, please let us know. Again, hello at asrg.io. Um, the point is that this is community driven. The members provide the content. They also enjoy the content. We have really great upcoming webinars. Um, first of all, next week, CAN bus reverse engineering with Raspberry Pi and socket CAN. So uh, David Evans is gonna be talking about how to use Raspberry Pi, very simple, easy setup, cheap implementation, and how to get it going. So really cool talk there. August 6th. We have Faye Francie in the house. She is Otto Isaac. If you don't know what Otto Isaac is, please look it up. This is a great organization helping the industry solve its information sharing problem. Check it out. August 13th, we don't have a presentation. Like I said, if you do want to present, if you have a topic, if you have some research, even if you just want to talk about something automotive security related, Please let us know. We would love to have you. August 20th, we have Houston. We have a problem. We have, have a problem. I don't know even how to say it. We have Vic Hartness in the house. Uh, we're going to, he's uh, from, oh, she's from S F Secure. Sorry. Uh, really cool talk. So really looking forward to this. We have more talks coming as well. Uh, as long as we can, we will be doing it every week. So without further ado, um, we have really a cool topic tonight. It's called Relay Attacks Applied to NFC Virtual Car Keys. And Enrico Pozzovani, this guy is like a researcher and he's great with the theory and trying to figure out how it doesn't work or how it does work. And his research is always really interesting. So we're really glad that he's with us tonight. Enrico, thank you for being here. Um, this is your show. Allowing me to speak here. Um, as you said, this is going to be a talk about uh, relay attacks applied to NFC virtual car keys. This is the update of the old relay attacks that were available on uh, passive entry systems, uh, just applied to the new uh, virtual car keys that uh, uh, nowadays you can get uh, working on your phone. Uh, first, a few words about me. Um, I'm Enrico Pozzoborn. I got a master's degree in telecommunication engineering uh, at the University of Padova in Italy, uh, where I'm originally originated from. And uh, in the last years, uh, I've been working on the development of penetration testing tools uh, specifically for the automotive industry under the PETS3 project at the OTH Regensburg, uh, together with Niels Weiss. So, 
what this talk is going to cover, uh, as we already said, uh, virtual car keys. Um, what you see in this picture is a little bit uh, wrong because um, this is uh, an iPhone and actually NFC virtual car keys up to this point uh, were not compatible with an iPhone. Uh, so all the research uh, I did uh, was, a, uh, was done on Android phones because uh, this technology uh, up to very recently was only available on Android phones. Hmm. And uh, phones are not the only item that can be used uh, to open a car in alternative to the key fob, but it's also possible to use uh, um, RFID smart cards. So something very similar to what we would use to do contactless payments. And this is why there is also a wallet here. Um, but the technology behind both is the same. So as I just said, there are two forms for these virtual car keys. Um, either in the shape of a credit card or as an app to install on your phone. And uh, the phone needs to have a secure element to be able to do this. And we will see more details about that later. Both are based on the ISO 14443A protocol. Uh, Enrico? Yes? Just a quick question. Why wasn't the iPhones allowed or they didn't have the function in the beginning. Um, I'm gonna cover this uh, in a few slides, I think, but it's mostly I, from what I could uh, uh, reverse engineer, it's mostly tied to the fact that the uh, OEM, the manufacturers for this technology were using um, a development kit that was uh, only compatible with, compatible with Gemalto embedded secure element. Mm. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And, uh, all right, so NFC virtual car keys, what do they do? Well, they replace uh, your key. So you can use them to open your car by placing them on the door handle. They can also close the car again by placing them on the door handle while the car is uh, open. And if you place them in the central console of your car, you can start the engine. Uh, the use cases for this is, of course, not having to carry around the key fob for your car, uh, especially nowadays, I've seen some enormous key fobs for some cars. So uh, yeah, the possibility of not having to carry one of them around can be appealing. And also another use case is uh, car sharing. Um, so for example, you want to share a car uh, between multiple people in the same family or even do some kind of car sharing service. And the nice thing here is that the provisioning of the virtual keys can be done online over the internet. And so the access for one specific key or one specific phone can be um, granted or revoked remotely without uh, uh, having to go through a, let's say, to, to go to a dealership to ask them to uh, enable the virtual key on, on a new phone. I've uh, looked into these uh, virtual car keys on three different uh, manufacturers. So on three different cars from three different manufacturers and all three uh, seem to be based on this uh, Gemalto embedded secure element. And this, um, I'm not 100% sure why this uh, framework was used to, to implement this, uh, probably because of its inherent security. And I will show later why it's supposed to be secure. Uh, all three of the analyzed cars uh, uh, work either with RFID cards that are provided by, by the manufacturer or with only with Samsung phones. So uh, Samsung Galaxy's phones, they come with these uh, uh, specific uh, embedded secure element from Gemalto. So 
probably this is the reason why only Samsung phones are compatible. Of course, in the future, we will see, um, actually already now, it's possible in the cars that are coming out right now. Um, I think that now iPhones are supported. I don't know about other brands of Android phones. And uh, some manufacturers require you to go to a dealership to pair your phone to your car, uh, at least for the first time. And then you can provision the access uh, yourself uh, on the app. Uh, other manufacturers allow you to pair any phone uh, that you want uh, and uh, let you do the procedure entirely inside the car. And so the question for my research was, uh, can this, uh, key, uh, the old key fob relay attack be replicated just on these new RFID NFC keys? So first let's see what this old relay attack uh, involved. This is uh, this picture and is taken from the relay attacks on passive keyless entry and start systems in modern cars from um, Aurelien, Fran, Sciol, um, and et al. And uh, this uh, relay was uh, implemented completely in an analog way. So the two sides uh, of this uh, attack, so the car and the key, they communicate using two different frequencies. Um, one direction of the communication from the car to the key is 130 kilohertz. The other direction, which is not illustrated in this picture, operates at 433 megahertz. And these two communications are uh, supposed to happen within a very uh, small latency is a very small time window. So the latency constraint is a really important part uh, of this attack. And this is why the attack was done in a completely analog way. And what you can see here, there is uh, some antenna near the car, some amplification equipment. The signal is up mixed to a suitable carrier, like 2.5 gigahertz. And this allows the signal to be broadcasted on a far longer range, like 100 meters, for example. And on the other side, the frequency is brought down to the original 130 kilohertz. And uh, the communication, the transmission is fed into the key. This is um, this uh, passive entry and start system uh, uses a challenge response mechanism. And therefore, the communication has to be relayed in both directions. So this picture only illustrates only illustrates one direction, but this operation is repeated twice. Uh, so the first uh, question is: Is it possible to just do exactly the same just for NFC? And uh, someone already tried this and was successful. So this was uh, from. Gerard Henke, um, this uh, RFID relay uh, using the, the same setup that we saw before. Uh, however, there are some limitations and some downsides that uh, might be limiting for an attack. Uh, first, uh, and actually this is the minor problem, the small introduced latency might cause problems with the anti-collision sequence, which is something I will talk about later, uh, which might be a problem if the uh, reader, if the car has multiple devices, multiple NFC devices in its range. But actually, the big problem I saw about this attack is that the mole device, which is the side of the relay that touches the victim card or the victim phone is very large and uh, it's definitely hard to hide, especially when you consider that uh, due to the very short range of NFC, this device needs to be in contact with the victim device. Uh, it makes the attack very obvious. And of, of course, uh, the, the range is limited. We, so here the range was 100 meters approximately. And 
yeah, maybe we want to do an attack from a higher, from a longer range. Uh, other people tried to do this and uh, were mostly successful in the uh, setup of relays, at, relay attacks uh, on payment systems. So here we have three, three, um, three presentations from three different uh, researchers. Uh, NFC hacking the easy way, which uses two Android phones to relay the communication. So one on the victim card side and one on the uh, payment uh, point of sale device. Um, another one here, the NFC payment relay attack. Uh, this one uses two PN532 chips, which are extremely small uh, NFC reader chips, which can also be used to emulate a card. And finally, manning the NFC uh, uses a different uh, chip to get closer to the hardware layer. And uh, all three were successful at uh, performing NFC relay attacks on payment systems. But when I went on to try these, uh, especially uh, the second one, um, when I went on to try these on a car, they didn't work. Uh, and I will show why. But first, a little bit of uh, explanation of what the previous research was doing. Um, here we have a credit card with a contactless payment uh, feature. The attacker places their NFC Android phone close to the victim card, another phone close to the uh, point of sale device. And in this way, they are able to um, take the money out of the credit card and use it to pay their own purchases. Uh, this side of the relay, the, re the, the side that touches the card is called a mole. And the side that touches the point of sale, uh, in our case, it will touch the car. This side is called the proxy. Now, as I was saying, this didn't really work uh, for cars uh, when I tried it. And uh, after some research, uh, I could figure out that it's basically due to some uh, fingerprinting that the car is doing on the device. So let's remember that payment point of sales, they have to be compatible with a large uh, number of variants of uh, cards and a large number of different phone brands. They, they have to be compatible with the, the entire ISO standard for NFC communication. So they cannot fingerprint one specific uh, device uh, to, to communicate with. For example, they have to accept uh, uh, keep alive strategies, which I'll talk about later. They have to support uh, Android phones, iPhones. And uh, this is why relaying the cryptographic challenges that are involved in the payment is possible both over Android phones and over PN532 chips. However, the NFC virtual key systems uh, that are used in cars are only compatible with specific phones and specific cars which are created by the, man by the manufacturer. So they only need to be compatible with one specific secure element. In this way, they can fingerprint the behavior of this specific secure element, and they can reject communication from other devices, like, for example, the PN532 chips. They can even reject communication from uh, calls made with the public Android SDK library for NFC. And the reason, and even, even if the phone you're using for the relay is one of the supported Samsung phones, the car can still tell the difference between the legitimate device and another phone. And this is due to the fact that the secure element is connected directly to the NFC controller. Um, 
this behavior is similar to what is called off-host card emulation by the Android SDK. Basically, here, the host CPU is not doing anything at all. The communication is happening entirely between the car, which in this case is this NFC reader, and the secure element, which is inside the phone. This can happen even when the phone is completely turned off. And this is probably the reason why uh, it's so important for car manufacturers um, to have this setup working. Because imagine your phone, uh, your battery is uh, your, your battery is flat. You're not going to be able to turn on your car and you're not going to be able to get into your car. So this system where the secure elements communicate directly with the car is uh, uh, fixing this issue. Now, the secure element looks different to the car than some communication that is going to happen directly with the host CPU. And this is why the car can reject communications uh, with Android phones. So the previous relays that I, that I presented from the literature, they didn't work. So I ended up uh, writing a new kind of relay for relaying NFC communication uh, and uh, to a car and to relay these uh, NFC virtual keys. Uh, and to do this, I used a Chameleon Mini, which is a device which uh, gets very, very close to the hardware layer. So the Chameleon Mini modulates the RFID signals in software using the DMA peripheral. And uh, basically it works uh, exactly in the same way as a software defined radio, but it's tuned to only one frequency, which is the NFC frequency, in this case, 1356 megahertz. Um, also part of the solution is to only relay the cryptographic material uh, and not the whole RFID communication. This allows me to have uh, all the messages that are constant replay, replayed to the car with the exact timings as the uh, legitimate hardware. And in this way, the car cannot distinguish between the legitimate secure element and the uh, messages that are sent by the chameleon. The cryptographic challenges are slow anyway. Even on the legitimate hardware, cryptographic challenges take a very, very long time to be computed. So the latency introduced by the relay is not relevant. Well, the, going back to the previous slide, since the secure element communicates directly to the car, the secure element has its own CPU, which is extremely uh, underpowered compared to the Android CPU. The cryptographic operations that are going to be executed on the secure element, they take uh, um, up to 100 milliseconds sometimes. So the added latency from an internet connection is not going to disrupt uh, this too much. And the car will accept the response, even if it comes uh, 400 milliseconds later. So here is the original plan for the fully embedded real-time solution. So since I was uh, worried that the latency might be a problem, I decided to implement everything as a, mm, yeah, a real-time uh, device, so as an embedded device. And here you see the relay from the victim phone to the victim car passing through a PN532 reader. Um, this is because the victim phone is not doing any fingerprinting on the car. Um, I'm then using two ESP32 Wi-Fi modules uh, using row 80211 uh, packets to uh, exchange the cryptographic challenge. And then 
once the cell, once the response is received, it gets forwarded to the uh, chameleon mini, which is going to do the last step in the communication. So this is the first solution which worked, but it was actually overkill because it turns out that for the cryptographic challenges, it is not necessary to have such a low latency. Latency is not an issue at all. And therefore, the solution got changed into this. Uh, now, the right side, the proxy side of the relay is exactly the same as before. But now we have UDP as a communication protocol. So this thing can uh, sub uh, send and challenges and receive responses over the internet. And then the relay side of the, um, sorry, the mole side of the relay uh, is implemented on an Android phone. Again, because the victim phone is not going to do any fingerprinting on that. And in this way, um, this makes the attack easier to make because um, the mole side can have any shape, can be a phone, it can be uh, placed into an hacked point of sale. And it might be very difficult for the victim to realize that they are uh, placing their phone on something that might possibly steal their car. Now, before I start explaining in depth how this relay works, I would like to talk a little bit about the terminology used in the ISO. Um, so I'm going to talk about PCD and PICC. Uh, the PCD is the reader. In the virtual key system, the reader, the PCD, is the car. The car acts as a reader, and the phone acts as a card. Uh, however, in the relay, this, the role of the PCD is taken by the mole, so the attacker's phone. The PICC is the card, sometimes it's called tag, sometimes it's called target. And uh, the PICC in the virtual key system is the victim phone or the victim's card. And uh, in the relay, this is implemented by the Chameleon Mini which is called the, the proxy side. So I hope this is clear. So on to the first step, the first steps in, uh, in this uh, project. The first steps were, of course, to, uh, to sniff the communication between the car and the phone and to reverse engineer the protocol. However, even this first step, which is supposed to be the simplest, was already a failure. Um, in the beginning, I tried using the Chameleon Mini to sniff the communication, but it didn't really work. For some reason, the Chameleon Mini was only displaying the PCD messages, so the communication from the card to the card, but not the other way around. And uh, also went on to use a Proxmark, which is a much more expensive device. And this one only worked outside of the car on the door handle, but it didn't work on the console of the car. Uh, maybe, I assume this was because the, the car was charging the phone wirelessly, and this introduced a lot of interference. But in the end, uh, no ready-made solution was available for me to sniff the communication successfully. In the end, what ended up working was manually demodulating a capture uh, taken with a real tech software defined radio. One of those really cheap software defined radios you can get from China from less than 10 euros. And then using some MATLAB uh, scripts, uh, yeah, demodulating it. Um, this shows that sometimes getting down to the lowest layers uh, uh, is the only way to achieve results. And uh, one funny thing that uh, about this is that the RTL SDR cannot actually get down to 13.56 megahertz, which is the frequency where NFC operates at. Uh, in fact, the lowest frequency it can be tuned at, I believe it's 20 or 24 megahertz. But um, I was lucky enough that uh, just capturing the uh, aliasing, the harmonics uh, on 
seven, on double the NFC frequency, so around 27.5 megahertz, was enough to demodulate the uh, NFC signal. So even using a device which is not tuned the, to the correct frequency gave better results than really, really expensive hardware um, that is supposed to be dedicated for sniffing. Um, okay, so to do this, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the entire stack of the NFC protocol, starting from the lowest possible layer. So to show how it was possible for me to demodulate the signal, I'm going to show how simple the NFC protocol looks like at the hardware layer, at the physical layer. Um, this um, protocol uses modified Miller encoding. And in this picture here, what you see, the red line represents the amplitude of the NFC carrier, which is emitted by the PCD, by the reader. Um, the carrier is also powering the card, because remember, many NFC devices, uh, many RFID cards, they don't have a battery. They are powered from the reader. So it's important that uh, the red line here, that the amplitude of the carrier doesn't uh, uh, pose, doesn't get dips uh, too often. And the modified Miller encoding, which encodes the zero in two different ways, uh, allows to make sure that the carrier is never interrupted for longer than 75% of the duration of one uh, symbol, of one bit. So th this is it. This is this, you, when you're doing a demodulating script in MATLAB, all you have to do is check whether the, um, the dip is in the second half of the time of the symbol of the bit, or if it's in the first half, or if there is no dip at all. And then you already know if you have a one or a zero. The other side of the communication, so the communication from the card to the reader is different. And the card communicates to the, re to the reader by switching a load. So changing its uh, impedance, changing its resistance in a way, uh, up to 848,000 times a second. This basically modulates a subcarrier, so it modulates another uh, wave, which is uh, at 848 kilohertz. And uh, this uh, uh, is then coded using Manchester coding, which is the simplest way uh, to code something. And you can distinguish a zero from a one simply by telling, OK, a one is modulated in the first half of the bit, and a zero is modulated in the second, second half of the bit. And that's all. Basically, once you know these two modulations, you can already just look at a capture uh even by even just looking at the trace with your eyes and you can already start demodulating the beats um finally just talking a little bit about the framing how these beats are put together you can get uh, short frames or standard frames actually the short frame only the first frame is a short frame the rest of the frames in a communication are standard frames uh, there is a starting bit, then there are eight bits to represent a byte, and after every byte, there is one parity bit. So in a way, it works similarly to um, UART serial protocol um, when you enable parity. And yeah, the start bit is chosen to be the Z the symbol from before uh, for the reader and one for the card to make sure that it's easy to synchronize to the beginning of the message. So, so every message starts with uh, this. So every message from the reader starts from 
starts with this symbol. So starts with a dip right at the beginning of the bit. And every message from the card starts with one of these uh, uh, one symbols. So here we have uh, what you would get if you just uh, get a, a capture with your software defined radio on the correct frequency. And then you compute the amplitude of the carrier, which is the blue line. And then what you do is you just look at, and you say, OK, this first dip here represents the first bit, the beginning of the first bit of the sent by the reader. And you know that the first bit starts here. And you know that the first bit is going to be a 0. And then you know that the second bit is probably also going to be a 0. And same thing for this part here. This part here is the response coming from the card and going to the reader. Um, yeah. So here you see that the start bit. And now I, I place the red lines where each uh, bit uh, starts and ends. And you can see that uh, it's quite easy to know the difference between uh, 0 or a 1. So this is definitely possible for this protocol to just look at the trace you're getting from your software defined radio and tell the bits in the packet just yeah just by looking at them without any software demodulation um, now moving upwards in the stack of this protocol we have the select and anti-collision sequences this is not really important for the relay and i'm gonna almost skip it, just know that this part is what is used for selecting between different cards if multiple cards are placed on the reader at the same time. Imagine you have your wallet full of uh, contactless payment cards um, and you place it in the center console of your car. This is the mechanism with which the car is able to select the correct card. Next, we have the ATS message, uh, the answer to select. This is important. Um, the ATS encodes all the capabilities of the card. It tells what is the maximum speed for the communication, which protocols are supported, and probably other information like the manufacturer and as other, other, other stuff. Um, this needs to be emulated correctly to convince the car that we are using some approved piece of hardware and not a relay. But it's just a matter of copying the one from the legitimate piece of hardware and uh, writing this into the chameleon configuration. Next, um, the block format. This is how the mm, frames uh, uh, are structured with the data. Um, there is a prologue field in the beginning of the frame, which uh, uh, is can be up to three bytes long. But in my experience, it's always one byte. I never saw these uh, optional bytes here. And um, then there is the information field where the application layer information is placed. And finally, there is the epilogue field, which is just a CRC for error checking. PCB, the first uh, byte of the prologue, is the most important byte of all. Um, it encodes with the first two bits the block type, second two bits are specific to each block type. Then we have two bits which determine if CID and NID are present. And uh, as I said, these are never present in all my tests. Then there is a bit which is constantly one. And finally, a block number, which is a sequence number. Only that since only one transaction can be active at a given time in NFC, uh, then only one bit is necessary to encode the sequence number. Now, the first, first, the first two bits of the PCB encode the block type. And uh, if the block type is a 0, 0, 
then this block, this frame, is just carrying application layer information. And uh, for stuff, for example, like the cryptographic challenge response mechanism used to start the car. And the block type 1.0 is an R block. And this is not super interesting. It's mostly used to acknowledge or send negative acknowledgments. This is used, for example, to ask uh, the card to repeat a message uh, when the reader failed to perform its uh, uh, checking of the CRC. Uh, however, it might be useful for a different kind of uh, relay to extend the um, waiting window. However, the most important block type for the relay that I built is the 1-1 um, block type, which is the S block. It can be used to deselect a card, meaning that it ends the communication. But more importantly, it is used to extend the waiting time. Um, and the extension, the amount of time requested is uh, carried by the information field. Now, this message works effectively like a keep alive for the card. So when the card is asked to perform some kind of cryptographic challenge uh, uh, operation, and it's going to take longer than the uh, time that is uh, allowed for an um, NFC transaction, the card will send out this WTX uh, uh, block to ask for yeah, the extension of the waiting time. So the car, when the, the car receives a WTX uh, packet as a response for a challenge, and it will just keep waiting for the next, uh, uh, the next information. Um, finally, finishing the stack, uh, we get to the application layer. And in, and in the NFC protocol, the application layer is exactly the same that was used in SIM cards. Uh, so it's the ISO 7816 APDU protocol. Uh, this one is very simple. There are uh, the reader send, sends command APDUs and the card sends response APDUs. Command APDUs are made out of a header, which is five bytes long. Some bytes for the common data, optionally the length of the expected response. On the other side, the response APDUs are just composed of the response data and at the end, two bytes for the status code. Uh, status code is uh, 9000 for success and uh, six uh, something for all the errors. So here we see an example of an APDU transfer. In bold, I've written all the communication from the ISO 7816 layer, so the application layer, and the other bytes, which are not bold, they are the lower layer communication. Here in yellow, there is the header. In blue, there is the command data. In dark magenta, there is the response data. And in red, we have the status board, the status code, which is a success in this case. So now to see how the virtual car key protocol works from the high level view from the application layer. Yeah, from the application layer, there are only four messages that are exchanged, two commands in total. The car sends out a select AID um, message. The select AID is selecting between all the possible applications that are installed in the phone or in the card. So the same card can have multiple applications uh, the, to select the one that is specific to the car manufacturer, um, a specific application ID, AID 
is uh, selected. This message, um, the phone can respond to this message instantly without uh, sending out any WTX message. Then the car sends out a cryptographic challenge. At this point, the secure element will compute the response and it will also send out uh, WTX messages to keep alive the connection. When the response to the cryptographic challenge is computed, it is sent back to the car with a response APDU. So as you can see, there are only two transactions. Now, this might be incomplete. I've, depending on the car manufacturer, the car brand, I've seen schemes in which other constant messages are sent before or after the cryptographic challenge response mechanism. And in other situations, I've seen uh, cars in which there are two cryptographic challenge responses transactions when you're trying to start the car. So if you try to start the car, it's going to send two challenges and uh, yeah, expect two responses. But, from, but this is an approximation of what you might find if you try to do this. Now, if we go look at a bit of a lower level at the same stuff, um, here, all of these messages uh, are the stuff I was talking about, the anti-collision sequence, selection of the card, answer to select, and acknowledgements. Uh, and finally, here, we have the first APDU, the first application layer packet. It is the select AID. The, the yellow part here is the header. Uh, A404 encodes the uh, instruction type for select AID. And in blue here, there is the AID that is getting selected. And I have anonymized it so you cannot recognize which, which car um, manufacturer this protocol is uh, uh, taken from. Um, we have the 9000 success from the card, from the phone, saying, yeah, the AID was selected successfully. Um, here we have the header for the next command, which is the cryptographic challenge. At this point, the secure element uh, takes too long to respond to the cryptographic challenge, and it will send the WTX message to ask for a longer time window. Uh, and the car will acknowledge this. So yeah, it confirms that the waiting time has been extended. The secure element will ask for even more waiting time extension. And the car acknowledges it. And finally, the response is sent here. Now, if you look at the actual time that it took um, um, here between the challenge and the response, what is this 60? Um, yeah, it seems like 60 milliseconds. And uh, another thing I would like to emphasize here is that if I try to send a WTX as a, as a response to a select AID command, the car will, some cars will immediately disconnect from the card. And this is a problem because this is a problem if you are using the uh, previous relays uh, from the literature, because for example, the PN532 always sends out um, WTX every time it receives a command APU because it assumes that the user application will take uh, quite a long time to respond. So finally, a high view, uh, high level view of the entire relay. We have the relay mole, which is constantly selecting the correct application ID on the victim phone, getting, getting it ready for as soon as it receives the challenge, it will send it to the victim phone. Um, then the relay proxy is, uh, is placed on the car. The car will select the AID. The AID, will get, uh, the AID selection will get confirmed by the proxy. The car will send the cryptographic challenge. The proxy will forward this cryptographic challenge to the mole while keeping the connection alive with WTX messages. 
Once the cryptographic response is received from the victim phone, the mole will forward, forward it back to the proxy and the proxy will uh, give it to the car and the car will accept it. Now here is a video showing me doing the attack on a car. The video didn't, please, okay. Okay, I don't know if you will hear the sound, but I can narrate what is happening here. Here, I have the attacker phone placed on top of the victim phone. In my hand, I have the um, ESP32 Odroid uh, device, the proxy device connected to the chameleon with a wire. So now I'm going to get the chameleon close to the door handle, which is currently closed. And you can see that the car opens. The car brand is censored, so you cannot recognize it. And finally, the, um, um, the chameleon is placed in the center console, which here was disassembled because uh, we were doing other tests on this car. Um, but uh, you can see that the car turns on. If you look here, you should see, yeah, the lights are on and the instrument cluster turns on. Okay. So the results is that the relay worked on all tested cars, three different brands, and the different tested systems. So we tested both cars and phones, and the relay worked for all of them, requiring modifications, of course, between them, because different application IDs, uh, different uh, answers to selection. Um, the cars will accept uh, a response, even if it comes 400 milliseconds after the challenge. And considering what we saw before, that the, uh, the actual challenge response on the secure element takes uh, around 60 milliseconds to be computed, uh, this gives us a budget of over 300 milliseconds to forward the challenge around the world. Even on the internet, of course, 300 milliseconds is a very, very long time. And uh, therefore, the real-time relay that I was showing before is not really necessary. The relay using the Android phone as a mole is more than enough. Let's talk a little bit about the attack feasibility. And the attack can be, the attack can be executed at any distance between the mole and the proxy. As I said, even across different countries, anywhere you get the internet, you can do this. The victim phone can be completely off. Uh, no user verification is necessary. The user just has to touch the car, right? Um, for example, a hacked payment terminal could be used to steal your car. Any place where you place your phone could have a hidden device to uh, submit crypto cryptographic challenges and steal your car. Moreover, since the victim phone can be completely off. Yeah, this is, um, this means that no user interaction is necessary. Um, the secure element is doing everything. Of course, in some cases, there are no, not even notifications. Of course, if the phone is off, you cannot get a notification that your car has been opened or started. Uh, there are massive limitations, of course, uh, to this attack. The main issue is that the mole and proxy need to be in uh, proximity of the victim devices. NFC only has a range up to at most four centimeters, unless you build very huge antennas. And even then, I doubt you can even get above one meter. And uh, of course, two challenges, two rounds of challenges need to be relayed successfully. One to open the car and one to start the car. And so you cannot just simply touch the victim's phone once. You have to do it twice at least to get the car to start. Um, here a little bit of countermeasure, uh, countermeasures for solving this attack that uh, I found interesting, proposed by this um, researcher down here. Um, the first was the counting of the WTX messages. So assuming that the relay requires the attacker to extend the waiting time, so to inject additional WTX messages, 
Then we can count the number of WTX messages that were sent or received on the two sides and use that as a cryptographic material in a second challenge response exchange. And uh, since the attacker can not manipulate the data because uh, the data is cryptographically signed at the application layer, um, then the attacker cannot introduce additional uh, waiting time extension packets. Uh, however, depending on the distance of the relay, uh, it might not be necessary to introduce additional WTX messages. Another technique that I found interesting was the distance bounding technique, where after the challenge response, the, um, the card pre-computes two responses, and the car, the reader, will send a large number of small one-bit uh, messages, um, which it will use to select between a bit from the first or the second challenge uh, response. Since these responses are pre-computed, the latency can be expected to be extremely low, and so WTX messages can be rejected entirely. And uh, this would definitely be uh, this will this will allow the the device to detect what distance the messages are uh, traveling because uh, of course there is no need for computation at all the messages are going to be sent as soon as uh, the command is received uh, however these countermeasures might be hard or impossible to implement on the current systems because it might require changing the hardware, basically. Um, definitely, the second system here requires uh, heavy changes to the protocol to be implemented. Um, I don't have enough information about the Gemalto Secure Element uh, SDK to know if the hardware can, uh, can do these countermeasures. So the bill of materials for the complete attack, excluding the proxmark, which was uh, useless in the end, um, we have the Chameleon Mini, which was around 100 euros. And uh, this was the most expensive piece uh, of kit necessary for the attack. Then an ESP32 microcontroller was used for the uh, proxy uh, side to connect it to the internet over Wi-Fi. Um, you can get cheap ESP32s, but I, I decided to use an Odroid Go that I had already laying around. Uh, this is expensive, but it has a screen, a battery, and some buttons, so it's really fun. Um, you, have a, you, you might want to buy a RTL SDR. I already, I already had one around. These are sold as um, digital TV uh, dongles for your computer, and they are less than 10 euros on, from China. And finally, any Android phone can be used for the mobile side of the relay. As far as time goes, the time for this project, this project was built on the side uh, over, the, over several months, and different cars were tested over yeah, different months. But um, to give an estimate of the amount of time it took to get it to completion, um, I would say the sniffing and reverse engineering of the protocol took way longer than it should have taken. Uh, this is due to the issues in the beginning with uh, not finding hardware that could actually sniff this communication and having to do it by hand. So yeah, I wrote 40 hours here. Mm, yeah, that sounds about right. It should have been much, much less if these tools worked. Building the hardware and the firmware for the different parts of the relay. OK, I wrote 60 hours here. This is probably excluding the first attempt using the, the, first, uh, the first version using uh, fully real-time hardware, which uh, didn't uh, allow for internet connection. So this one, 
yeah, in 60 hours uh, for building the all the Chameleon firmware modifications and the firmware for the ESP32. Finally, the Android application was really, really fast to build uh, because there is already an example on the website on how to do it, um, how to do a card reader with Android. Then you just need to attach a UDP socket on it and you're done. Um, support for different cars also didn't take much because all the cars that I saw, they all use the same uh, uh, Gemalto SDK apparently, and they are very slight differences between the different protocols. So it was quite easy to implement support for the different cars. Um, talking about the Android app, as I was mentioning, it's based on this uh, example from the Android SDK. This example is not available anymore for some reason. It's considered uh, deprecated, but you can find it on the internet. All it does, it constantly tries to connect to the RFID card to, uh, to the victim phone or the victim card. It constantly selects the correct AID until when a UDP packet comes, uh, which contains the challenge. Then it submits the challenge to the card. And as soon as it gets the response, uh, it uh, sends it back to the sender of the UDP packet. So uh, this is a, a, a quite a simple uh, app. Um, I think I also added uh, a keep alive mechanism on the UDP um, protocol to, to connect to the other side and get it ready. But in principle, it's very, very simple. The ESP32 firmware for the proxy side is basically the same. It's a UART to UDP adapter. Uh, UART, the serial communication here, the wires on top here, they are going to the chameleon. And the ESP inside this uh, Game Boy case is connecting to Wi-Fi and using UDP to transfer the challenge and the responses. And the buttons here can be used to change between different victims. And uh, Finally, the Chameleon Mini firmware uh, modifications. I wait a second. This is not the mold. I, this is an error. But so by default, the Chameleon Mini firmware has to respond to comments as soon as they come. So it cannot uh, uh, wait for a exchange over UART to finish before sending a response. This is due to the way the Chameleon firmware uh, is uh, programmed. It's um, a real-time uh, operating system, let's say. And uh, it needs to be, it's really, really tight on the deadlines, on the, yeah, on the times for this real-time system, because it needs to constantly read data from the DMA and feed data into the DMA for modulating and demodulating the NFC signal. Um, so the modifications for getting it to work as a component for the relay were quite massive. And you can find all the, uh, the sources here at this link. And the, I, I, don't remember, I, I changed these, uh, the code that I like this code that I committed on GitHub doesn't contain any message that is specific to the cars that I tested. So it cannot be used out of the box to steal cars, hopefully. But, and actually the only way it can be used is for the demo that I'm gonna do soon. Um, also small hardware modification on the Chameleon Mini. The challenges uh, are relayed over UART three, uh, UART E zero, this uh, serial peripheral here. This is the only communication to the outside world from the chameleon other than the USB. And the ESP32 doesn't support USB, so I had to solder a header here to get the data out to the ESP. Also, I soldered some wires to ground and reset and power. Uh, this allows the ESP to turn on and off the chameleon and uh, to reset it. So that's it. Can I, do I have time for making a small demonstration? 
of the relay and all the components? Yeah, definitely, Enrico. I think a okay. demonstration would be really cool. So here, hopefully you can see it. Oh, mm, okay. This is, the, the window has disappeared. Okay, here. Um, this is a camera pointed at my desk. I just a little bit of a demonstration of the different pieces of hardware used for this relay. This is the RTL SDR. Uh, this is what is inside one of those. Um, I opened it to be able to solder an SMA connector because the, the connector it comes with by default, I it didn't have a wire for it. So yeah, I just soldered the disk connector onto it. The antenna that I've been using for NFC uh, is just a loop of wire connected to an SMA, and, yeah, an SMA header. And uh, the way you use it is you get your your phone, your tag that you wanna, or in the, in the case of a car, this will be this will be the car, this will be the phone, the card, and then I just get this close to the phone while placing the coil between the phone and the and the card, and yeah, like this. I place them like this while recording with uh, a software defined radio program but uh, yeah that's it for how you get captures uh now to do the actual demonstration what i have here i don't have a car so i cannot show that what i have here is uh, my phone uh, which uh, and uh, which is gonna simulate the car and i have this uh, st25 uh, uh, ta uh, nfc tag so if I get this tag close to my phone on the back, what you see on the top here is the URL which is contained in this uh, tag. And now I'm going to show you that I can relay this over the over the local area network. Um, so the components that I'm going to use is are okay, here. This is um, this Samsung phone. I installed the um, mole side. Uh, this one, as you can see here, it connects directly today, it connects directly to the ESP32. Uh, and this is going to be the mole of our relay. This is the ESP32. This is the ESP32 uh, proxy with uh, the uh, chameleon attached to it with a wire and now to simulate the attack i'm gonna place the, the tag which uh, is supposed to be the uh, um, the nfc phone with the car the virtual car keys i'm gonna place it under the uh, mole and you can see that the mole is uh, spitting out some log about having selected the aid correctly and Finally, I'm going to place the chameleon here. And, I'm, and if everything works, I'm going to place my phone on it. Wait a second, need to keep everything awake. OK. And if I can get it in the right place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, something is not working. And uh, yeah, I let me restart the NFC reader application on my phone. This is always the, the part of yeah, the phone. Yeah, this is always the case, right? Um, yeah, I see some... Oh, okay. There you go. It it happened. Uh, you can see the URL, which is uh, contained in uh, in the tag, appeared here. And um, yeah, didn't work first try, but almost. <laughs> <laughs> and other than that, let's talk uh, uh, to finish this. Um, this talk. Uh, future developments. Um, let's. Uh, there is this ultra, ultra wideband. Uh, uh, digital car keys uh, upcoming in the very near future. Uh, 
um, apparently the latest iPhone already has this and the BMW cars that are manufactured from now on should have this. So uh, hopefully this is more secure. Um, reading at the specifications of the protocol, it's supposed to be immune to many in the middle attacks and to relay attacks, but we will only know after somebody tries to do it. So yeah, thanks for watching. Uh, follow me on Twitter, I have a Twitter account, but I never use it. So if you want to follow someone for my updates, follow Niels. Uh, and he, every time we discover something or we have some research development, uh, he is the one that is going to post it on Twitter. Yeah. So any questions? All right. Well, <laughs> Enrico, thank you very much. That was such a great, like really in-depth pre presentation about uh, NFC virtual car keys. Thank you very much for uh, presenting your research and, and application in the real world. So love to see that. We we do have a few questions, Enrico. Um, the, the first one is coming from Mohammed. He's he's asking, this was really early on in your presentation. You said um, that you need to go to the dealership to get your key provision to your, your phone provision to your car. Uh, and he was wondering what, what would happen if you want to change your phone? Can I remove uh, the virtual key from my old phone? How does that work? Yes. So once the first pairing of the phone is uh, executed, so once the car is paired uh, with the phone, uh, then you can log into your online account uh, and uh, choose to enable or disable the virtual key from any of the associated phones. So the use case would be, let's say you have a family with uh, several people wanting to use the same car and not wanting to share the key because yeah, maybe there isn't enough key fobs for everybody, for everyone. Uh, what you will do, uh, you can uh, pair up all the phones at the dealership. And then whenever somebody loses their phone or the phone breaks or it gets stolen, you can just log into the online system and uh, uh, revoke access for that phone. Mm -hmm. So the pairing is only necessary in the uh, beginning and then they can be revoked or access can be granted uh, yeah, later on. Okay, great. Um, Stylus is also asking, um, when you when you talked about these different countermeasures that are included, the WTX, um, and you had this overkill kind of like concept. If you remember, like you were using two ESPs to have a more real-time communication. Uh, he's asking, would your overkill real-time mole device overcome the WTX countermeasure? Um, that's possible. However, these, uh, this is the overkill real-time solution. Um, the problem with this is that, um, so, to keep latency as low as possible, I introduced this, uh, um, I use this low, low layer row 8 or 211 protocol for the communication between the mole and the proxy. Uh, so this uh, kind of stops you from extending the range of this solution very yeah, to a very long range. Let's say you can only get up to what, 10, 20, maybe 100 meters, uh, basically the limit of Wi-Fi. Um, also, there is a limitation here. Using UART, uh, UART is quite slow. So if I were to make this, for, if I were to optimize this for low latency, next, if, if I were to remake this and optimize it for low latency, what I will do is replace UART with something faster, maybe even um, design a PCB or something that, uh, allows the ESP to do directly the modulation. So there are ways, what I'm trying to say is there are ways to lower the latency. And of course, uh, there is the even more low latency approach 
which is this uh, analog relay here um, applied to RFID, which was successfully executed. Um, however, the big limitation of this is that it doesn't allow you to relay the communication over a very, very long distance. Like you cannot go over the internet uh, with this kind of relay or with uh, or with this kind of relay, but you definitely mm -hmm. can do it when you when you use IP and UDP. And the problem there is that the latency, the buy, the the latency, the the bottleneck for the latency becomes the internet connection. Mm -hmm. But you know, definitely there are some areas, some kind of setups in which the WTX uh, um, countermeasure might not work. Okay, great. Thanks for the answer. Um, just uh, one last question here. Uh, Klaus was asking, you know, you you see all these special types of wallets, you see these containers and so on. Um, so it's, do these, do these special wallets, you know, that are there to protect your payment cards, would these also work for um, your phone? Um, huh, okay. I have um, such a wallet as well that is supposed to stop uh, RFID communications and it doesn't really work. I can still open the office door even though my card is inside uh, one of these when I get it close to the RFID reader. Um, but applying such a thing to a phone, you mean like having a cover over your phone that um, stops uh, uh, NFC communication, yeah, that that could uh, that could work if the cover actually works and if the cover correctly shields uh, all NFC communication, then yes, that would uh, stop uh, this kind of attack. I think this is kind of the same topic as we had for the the high tech, the the, the lower frequency stuff. Um, mm -hmm. When you're not talking about NFC or virtual keys, actually, you can take your key fob and put it in a Faraday cage, right? So right. Bas basically a container that's uh, grounded and doesn't allow the, the transmission of radio frequency through it. Um, and of course, then it would be safe. But then once again, you've also destroyed the function. And this is what yes. happens a lot of the times is that when we, we try to make things safe, well, the best way is, okay, if you don't want to have risk of driving a car, don't drive a car, right? So yeah. uh, it's always a trade-off. There is this trade-off between convenience and uh, security, of course. Uh, for example, one proposed countermeasure could be let's say every time you try to open your your car with your phone the phone asks you for a pin code of course this is not convenient at all and on top of this it also stops your phone from working as a key when the phone is off right so yeah this there all is right. always a trade between convenience and security that's right we we know this balance very well <laughs> Um, you know, the, the best way to reduce risk is, well, of course, don't turn it on. Right. Oh, so. but in this case, the phone, the phone is still acting as a key, even when it's off. <laughs> That's true. In this case, it would be just don't pair it with the car. <laughs> All right. Well, Enrico, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, one last question is, can we have the slides and can I... Publish them to the members. Yes, definitely. I will send you the link immediately. Uh, are you... Very great. So right. um, once again, Enrico, there. thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, before we close tonight, would you like to say anything? Um, not really. I already said uh, all the contact information here. Uh, what else? Uh, um, I'm hopefully gonna yeah. 
uh, there's going to be a talk on the car hacking village with me and Niels. Um, when is it? Is it on the 8th of August? Mm -hmm. I, if, I'm, remember, if I remember correctly, so you can see me there. And yeah, that's it. Great. Well, it, thank you very much, Enrico. Uh, just like he said, he's going to be giving a talk at Car Hacking Village at DEF CON. DEF CON this year is virtual, COVID safe, so to say. Check it out. Uh, Enrico, along with many other presenters, are going to be there. I'm also coordinating and working with the Car Hacking Village. So please uh, check back with us at ASRG as well, or we see you at DEF CON. So guys, thank you very much. Thank you for being here at ASRG and we will see you next week. All right, have a good thank evening. You. Have a good evening as well. Thank you again and yep, yeah. bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao.